It is cold this morning. Luckily, I got the heater on. Welcome back to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now be done by Disney or Clint Lucasfilm. Whichever way you slice it. Legends. Now, today, I have for you guys the finale to the Fate of the Jedi novel series, book nine, by Troy Denning, Apocalypse. So as for non-spoilers, it's going to be really short, because uh, this is a lot of action. I'd say this is the equivalent to uh, Unifying Force with the Yu Song Vong, except on surprisingly a much, at least it feels like a much smaller scale. So, um, there's that. That, that is a, uh, um, that is that. I mean, the Jedi come to Coruscant to face the Sith, and of course, Avaloth. It's a grand finale, lots of battles, lots of fighting, betrayals, um, and uh, mysterious characters who have become very, very, very important later, um, and who, if memory serves by what I've seen on YouTube, are, are in the past as well. And you might know who I'm already referring to, don't know. Um, as I said, I'm going through this for the first time, so I just get, you know, when you're exploring the expanded universe, you inevitably come into some sort of spoiler, so um, there are certain things I know about that, you know, I'll have full context for when I get to it, but there is a character here that if you've been reading all, everything that you could possibly read in the Star Wars Expanded Universe, then you would have already seen this person, and he will be a big part in the future of the Expanded Universe. So, that is all I'll say with that. Um, and it leaves with many lingering threads, and sadly, I don't know how many of those threads um, will be followed up on because of the cancellation of the Expanded Universe, but we shall see the last two books, Mercy Kill uh, by Aaron Olsten and Crucible, um, what possibly could be filled. Anyway, so that's pretty much it, just the grand finale. Uh, I, there's nothing else really to tell you, it's the grand finale, if you've been reading all the books and you know what's going on, I don't know why you'd um, watch a review about book nine in a nine book series, you know. Uh, I'd assume you'd read the first eight parts at this point. This is the grand finale. They come to Coruscant to fight the Sith. Um, and they do. <laughs> so, that is about it for non-spoilers. I'm going to get into spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, it's time for you to leave. So, Book 9, Apocalypse. It's just an all-out assault. You have, you know, Vistera, you have Ben, you have Luke. Um, they're, you know, trying to sneak back into Coruscant because the Sith have, you know, taken control of that. Uh, well, Abeloth really has, but the Sith are over there. Um, and so they're trying to get to, like, the checkpoints and stuff to get into Coruscant. Um, and there's this, uh, weird man they notice, um or that Luke notices, with some weird tattoos and different colored eyes. Um, and he will become a bit more important in this very book later, but much more important in the future. But we'll get back to that. Um, uh, Wynne Dorvin, who has probably been one of the best characters this series, I think, introduced, because I don't think we ever heard of this guy before. We might have, I don't know. But he's, he's been really cool in this series. I've enjoyed his character. Uh, he tries to kill Abeloth, um, and he seemingly is successful, except, just like Calista Ming, Abeloth is able to put herself into a computer, so it doesn't work out for him. Um, Raynar is sent on a mission with Lobaka, and I forget who the other people were, but I know Lobaka and C-3PO, to talk to the Killix about Abeloth and learn more about her history. So that is, maybe that's something I could have mentioned in non-spoiler, whatever, it's fine. Um, that's what he goes to find out, and we'll discuss that in a bit. In the temple, uh, the Jedi temple, um, Luke, Jaina, 
Kyle, I think. Yeah, Kyle Katarn. Uh, Vistera, Ben, Jess Lahorn, and Valenhorn. They're all in there trying to do stuff. Um, Vistera gets separated from them. Because I, I really didn't have that many notes like that early on. It was just like, fight, fight, fight. Um, and she feels trapped and cornered. And at this point, she's already betrayed the Jedi Order by killing um, the, the falling Jedi. I forget her name. But she, she killed her to save Ben because she was selfish and didn't. I mean, again, I understand why she did it. But at the same time, I don't think she's true Sith. But she is definitely more in the middle leading dark than she is light at this point. So she, to save her own skin, because, you know, the Lost Tribe doesn't really like her anymore, and <laughs> neither, uh, I mean, after this, the Jedi won't, but she tells this, this Sith, um, Elena's real identity. Um, so at this point, she's practically betrayed our heroes. Um, Tahiri is, goes to meet Fett, because um, she thinks that Fett is working with Dala and Abeloth, but we soon find out that is not the case. Um, we finally learn about the Mortis history. We learn about, um, you know, we, we learn about stuff about the ones even before the Clone Wars episode. We, we learn about, not, not much, it's, it's little sprinkles, but we learn about their life before the Clone Wars, how the mortal woman showed up. This is stuff I already knew from YouTube. Um, because that's just, you know, one of the things I heard going into the EU was Darth Kytus because Kylo Ren uh, and Abeloth. Those are the big post Return of the Jedi stuff I heard about. And, of course, Thrawn. Um, that was really all I, I, I knew about. I didn't know any context around it. I didn't know anything about the story. I just knew who those characters were. And I knew Abeloth's backstory. Uh, and then I knew the legacy comics bad guy what he looked like so that's why even though i haven't read that series i was surprised i mean i wasn't surprised because i also knew he'd show up but anyway <laughs> um it was um still interesting and the killicks were such a weird species but of course troy denning wrote them so he brings them back in um and i felt really scared for um Raynar, um because he's going back to this place that he was trapped in for, you know, for quite a few years um, to try to figure out this information. And they're like, we want you back. I imagine that wasn't easy on him when he finally, like, started to become himself again. There is, um, Tahiri and Fett, Tahiri meets up with Fett, and he's, like, being attacked by, like, this weird, uh, weird thing moss or moss thing i don't know it was something like on the wall that was being done because of abloff it wasn't a tentacle though but it was like grabbing him and stuff and he couldn't get out he used his flamethrower and everything he could think of and it wasn't working so tahiri and fett talk for a bit and they finally decide to team up and we also find out in this book i mean it was already i was suspected i never said anything about it and looking back it definitely makes a lot of sense that Abeloth can inhabit multiple bodies at one time. It's kind of like, uh, uh, I know people, some people hate my analogies because they're like, I haven't seen everything you've seen. It's just what I do. There is a movie called Age of Ultron. It's part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and the whole, in the whole movie, he's a robot created by Iron Man. I'm sure you know who Iron Man is. He... Uh, wants to get a better body um, to inhabit or whatever. Uh, but he also has a bunch of little mini robot bodies that if you kill one body, he can take over the other and make it look like how it looks. Uh, so uh, he's able to do that at will. But I think it's just him switching over to the other, whereas this is like she's actually, her mind is in several at once, which is kind of weird. I'm sure there are better uh, examples of that in fiction. I can't think of any at the mo moment, but I know they're there. Um, but so, while Fett and um, and Tahiri are, of course, fighting Abeloth at this, you know, uh, scientist base, because the reason Fett's there in the first place is because he's trying to find a cure to the nanovirus 
that the Empire gave to him and his daughter uh, in Legacy of the Force that prevents them from going back to Mandalore. So, at the meanwhile, um, you know, I've, the Jedi at the temple are fighting Abeloth. And that was another thing. I was really surprised because I kept talking, I, I, for some reason, even though I knew this, uh, I had forgot. And so, Luke and Jaina, they're fighting this this one Sith who's doing better than all the others. And they're like, why is this one giving us so much trouble? And it's because it's not a Sith, it's Abeloth in a, in a Sith body, of course. So, that was cool. Um, yeah, and it's crazy that she can be in so many bodies. It really does show how powerful she is. It's just sad that it can't really be utilized. Uh, it's the one thing about this series that I have just been kind of disappointed on is just that, like, they claim that she's a bigger threat than Yu Song Vong, but in a series it never seems that way because we never get to see her be that much of a threat. She, you know, she finally does like a lot of stuff in this book, but as of now, having read all nine books, this is certainly smaller scale than the Yu Song Vong War is. Now, I guess I should have suspected as such because I heard people say in the comment sec, the comment sections of like different, you know, Star Wars videos, like, yeah, it never gets as high stakes as it does in, you know, the Vong War. Everything's always smaller scale after that. I'm like, oh, I just. For an entity, it's supposed to be such a Lovecraftian, powerful behemoth of power. It doesn't feel like we ever really get to witness that. And maybe it's for the best that the galaxy isn't in turmoil and pain and suffering. At the same time, I mean, she does stop. It's not as if she's not a threat. She's most certainly a threat. It just feels like I only really started to feel that way in the last two books. And I would have really liked to, you know, have really been like, oh, this woman is, she's scary powerful. And like the, you know, at least by book five. And I didn't feel that way. And that was like the first time they fought. She was a threat, but it didn't seem like um, a top tier threat. Anyway, that's just how I felt. Um, <laughs> there is a, an empire election. Uh, but of course Jag's got everything under plan. You know what I, I love about Jag? I might have said this in the last one. I'm not sure. Last video. Jag is like the perfect blend of everything that was good about the Empire with none of the bad and everything that's great about like the Jedi or the Galactic Alliance and it like meshes so well together. You know, I think he would do Thrawn proud. I don't know if he'd be able to beat Thrawn in tactics or politics I think he'd give him a good run for his money. I mean, of course, at the time of the Thrawn trilogy, Jag was in his younger years, but if Thrawn were somehow still alive, I do think Jag would be quite a challenge. Because Jag is... That's one thing I love about him. He's, he acts like he has a stick up his butt. But he actually has quite a bit of comedy like Han Solo. It's a bit more dry than Han Solo. Um, he can fight, you know, just as well as Han Solo can, if not better. Um... And he's also really good with the politics, like Leia. Um, and at the same time, he's also quite a tactical genius, when like Thrawn is. And I, I don't know, I just love... Jag is like this just big amalgamation of so many characters that I like. And it really just works. Um, but he does a basically presidential, but it's an emperor debate with Dala someone who didn't really want to be there, but he said, you have to run so you can become the emperor. And then Jag. Um, and he basically offs himself from the start by saying, oh yeah, I did this, I sent Hikiri to that facility. But look at what Dala's doing, making it so both of them basically have no chance of winning. And so it can only go to the one other guy. I just, I really enjoyed that scene, it was really fun. Um, despite what was going on in the galaxy, that was fun. Um, I am wondering, though, because that's one of the loose threads I don't know about, that the 150-year gap could have cleared up for me, which is there is a fell empire in the Legacy comics. So does Jag at some point try to take over as the Emperor again for some reason or another? Because as of right now, unless that gets picked up on in Crucible, 
And that's kind of a loose thread there. So, uh, what's next? After Tahiri and Fett kill the one Avaloff body, the one that Luke and Jaina and everyone were fighting, seemingly got hurt, seemingly got weaker. So she retreats for a bit to the ship. The ship that we first saw. Well, I'm sure it probably was before that. But the first time I saw it was in Legacy of the Force. That ship. The Sith ship. And they're discussing that. And how that's a thing. And that's when they finally realized the multiple bodies thing. But they also mention that there's this dark side force user who isn't fighting the Jedi. It's just kind of observing and looking at everything around him. Um, and one, when one of the Jedi decides, this guy has a dark side order, I'm going to go take him in. Disarms him. The guy disarms the Jedi without killing him. This is not today, Jedi. Abeloff first. And they don't know what to make of that. That is because... That is Darth Krait. He's never spoken by name because, of course, he must be kept a secret because he doesn't actually do much till later. But Darth Krait is the next one I'm going to consider because he already seems cooler and I've even read his comic series yet. Uh, true Sith Lord, even though <laughs> I've also seen uh, people say that he talks to the... Uh, old Sith and they don't like him so that'll be interesting but um, in the legacy comics he is the main antagonist um, he somehow does this hibernation thing where he's able to be alive 150 years later but he's around now and he sees that Avaloff is a big enough threat and so he comes seemingly at first to observe later of course if you've read this book you find out he helps um, so I, I don't know why people would only, you know, I understand people that don't really like comics and like, I mean, I haven't read it yet, but I imagine I've heard a lot of good things about it. And especially since it'd be one thing if it wasn't mentioned or if it wasn't important to the novels and stuff, but the novels directly mention this. So it's probably worth your time to check it out later or at least mention the character. So I don't know. Because uh, he's not connected to the Lost Tribe of Sith at all. He has the one Sith, and this has been something that's been trinkling in. I mean, I think the comics were made before Legacy and Fate. But still, if you're reading this chronological order, they've been sprinkling in this secret Sith society. Or letting you know about it. I think it was even, you know, after, a little bit, probably during the Vong War. No, it probably would have been right after. Yeah, during his five-year sojourn. But... The One Sith, which is a different philosophy from the Rule of Two, and the Sith of Old, it's a different philosophy. But they've been in the shadows since, you know, seemingly the end of the Vong War. Um, and so they've been sprinkling this all in for the comics that'll be coming up soon. So, uh, I don't know, you might want to check it out. If not buy it, then maybe, you know, look it up online at least where you can read it for free because there are websites where you can do that. I bought it, but anyway, <laughs> getting off topic. Sorry. This is, this is what I do sometimes. Uh, I'm not off topic, but I'm ram. I'm going on when I already could have made my point move. Anyway, so next thing is one second, actually. Sorry about that. Had to go for a second, but um, Sith, uh, Sith, Abeloff's plan is to have a new family of the ones. So, you know, we've been seeing Ben since, well, I mean, the Darkness trilogy, he was there. He started to have a character, but I fell in love with him in Legacy. But time and time again, he went to the planet Zyost, he interacted with his cousin Jason, and through and through he stayed with the light. So, he... Despite all of his trials and tribulations, he stays light side. Um, Abeloff recognizes this. She wants him to drink from the font of power and become 
basically what the sister was in the Clone Wars, who wants, wants him to become the embodiment of light. Problem is, he's not a celestial, or he's not, you know, whatever they were. He's just immortal, so if he were to drink from that, he would become another creepy-looking thing like her. And then same thing with Astera. She senses the darkness in her, and how, while she does love Ben, she's willing to do the dark things, so she could perfectly embow the the dark side, like the sun did in the Clone Wars. And she would be some weird twisted father, even though she can't keep the palace, because she herself is chaos. Um, but that's her plan. Uh, will it succeed? Probably not. See, like, the implication is really big and dangerous to the world. But the actual threat in a book... Well, this one it was. It's just previous books didn't feel as such. Now... Luke goes with Jaina to go save Ben. Not really Vistera, because at this point they know that she's betrayed them. But they go to save Ben. But while they're flying to the Maw, Luke goes back into the land, the, the land beyond shadows, or whatever it's called, where his soul, spirit, force, essence leaves his body, like, like he did in earlier books, and goes to fight Abeloff's, like, spirit and who joins him we still don't get a name but Darth Krayt Darth Krayt comes to help Luke defeat Abeloth now what I love is that um, Jason even says you can't trust this guy this is the guy I saw in my visions this is the guy, the dark guy sitting on the throne. And he's like, maybe so, but you need my help to defeat Avaloth. And so they work together to defeat Avaloth. Uh, or to defeat her spirit, which makes her a lot weaker um, afterwards. And so that whole part was really cool. I mean, I imagine if you've already read the comics, that's cool for you. But I haven't read those yet, and even still, I thought this mysterious being was super cool. And, like, that's another thing. This book does a good job of making me want to read those comics now. Because I'm like, I want to see more of this guy. Like, I don't know who he is, but I want more of it. You don't even get his name, and yet his presence and the things he says are so mysterious and stuff. And he's like, Luke's like, of course there are spies. You have a spy on Coruscant or whatever. He's like, and Darth Krayt's like, you think I... You think there's only one? We Sith are legion. And Luke's like shaking his head and he's like, you're not the Lost Tribe. They don't keep permanent tattoos and, and whatever else, you know? And he's like, too many questions. I said I came here to fight, not to talk. Because he's not a part of the Lost Tribe. And he doesn't follow the rule too. He is a new thing. Um, so that'll be interesting to check out later. But... I really enjoyed the conversations they had. I enjoyed how Jason's spirit thing kind of freaked out at the sight of him. Um, and I enjoyed the team up. It was cool to have the Grand Master of the Jedi Order versus a man who will, I think it's his great great, I don't know if it's three greats or two, who will kill his grandson <laughs> and destroy the new the, the Jedi Order. A second purge. <laughs> um, so, Abeloth is seemingly defeated. Of course, she's not dead because she didn't have the Mortis dagger stabbed into her, so she's still around. But, Ben and Jaina come out to try to capture Vistera. And she, of course, gets away. And ship titles her the new Sith Lord, Dark Lord of the Sith. And I'm like, uh, uh, okay. That's another thing that's not going to be really probably addressed that much because Legends got discontinued anyway. So that's just a thread that's there. Uh, I, okay. I mean, now we have her. We still have the Lost Tribe of the Sith out there. We still have Abeloth out there. That's another loose thread. And Darth Krayt all skulking around like it's just so clustered now it wouldn't be a problem if that all got settled in novels and comics 
but we don't have that. I can't imagine that Crucible will just answer all those questions. I did. So, I don't know. Um, but now she's a Sith Lord. I imagine Jaina will, would have beaten her, maybe, in the Sword of the Jedi book. I don't know. Uh, but that's what she is now. I mean, I guess even in 150 years now, she'd be dead anyway, so it doesn't matter. But still. Uh, what I do like, though, about the Abeloth thing is it says that she could come back in 100 years, she couldn't come back in 100,000 years, but regardless, she's still a threat, and he wants all the Jedi, or like a select few Jedi, to go on a mission to basically find the Mortis Dagger. So that way, when she does come back, whether it's in their lifetime or not, um, the Jedi at the time will be able to defeat her once and for all. Um, and also, Luke was already planning on leaving Coruscant with the Jedi, but uh, now the Coruscant people, with all the fires and stuff going on and the gases on Coruscant due to Abeloth's tinkering, they now really, really, really must leave because they don't want them there no more. But that's fine by him. And this book ends on a happy note with Jaina and Jag getting married. Which is really nice. And good for them. So now they're a married couple. And of course everyone's going to now know that Alana is the daughter of Tino Ka. So that's about it. Overall the last two novels I really really enjoyed. Uh, the other seven, there are aspects that I enjoy in all of them, but I don't know if I particularly love them. I don't hate them. They're not on like my top ten worst or anything, because I guess they would fit up most of the spots if they did. Um, they're just okay. I don't really like them. I can see why now a lot of it, you know, kind of is slow, because all of it builds up to this final one where a lot of revelations are made. Still, though, a lot of it felt kind of dragging on. So, overall, net positive. I think this series is worth your time. Uh, do I think this is the best of the EU? Probably not. Uh, this is definitely my least favorite of the post-Return of the Jedi stuff, I think I can say. I think New Jedi Order, Legacy of the Force, both of those are, at least if we're talking novels here, are far a far superior series. Um... This one just dragged for me a bit too much. Um, different, interesting ideas, some interesting characters, uh, a great, unique, and interesting villain. I like, really love that. I love how it ties into one of the few good parts of the Clone Wars TV show. I love that, because they were always such a mysterious and interesting thing, the, the ones. Um, mm -hmm. And to bring in this, this terrifying, Lovecraftian sort of threat, just sort of love that to be more expanded upon dealt with more but for what we got it was cool um definitely can see why you never make a movie with that star wars is for kids and i would i can't imagine a kid would ever sleep again if they saw this thing on screen so kind of glad we never got an on-screen appearance of that because that would be pretty terrifying um but uh and i really loved Fistera. um it took me a long time to like her but i did even now with her betrayal i still think she's probably one of the most um dynamic of characters um the lost tribe of sith i still just don't really care about they're not as bad as i thought before they expanded upon them a bit they're still just not my cup of tea um and then as for everything else i mean yeah, I mean, the Jason stuff in the previous books was interesting. Um, book four just, it just, I can't, I can't get over the fact that the main plot of the book was around the Doth Mary people, and the whole section of that I just didn't care about. It was just whatever to me. I mean, it, like, it, this is like stuff that we've seen before. Yeah, I guess, like. The difference is now the men are revolting back, but I don't know. I just I didn't care. <laughs> and then, oh, speaking of which, the Doth Mary witches or, or just woman being stolen, Force sensitives, men, I think too. That never got brought back up again. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, they got kidnapped and then never showed up again. So um, definitely makes that feel even more pointless now. 
I mean, the only thing that was of substance is that Ben Stiller's relationship with Ben changed slightly, and then she ended up joining them for a whole year after that. But yeah, sorry. Anyway, overall net positive, uh, least favorite series, but still fun time. Uh, up next, we have X-Wing, Mercy Kill, Myron Olsten, Crucible, and then the Legacy Comics. And then we'll back in time. So I'll see you guys then. Until then, have yourselves a wonderful day. And may the Force be with you.